Dear ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to be here. I have been asked to share one of my poems and many with you. The poem is in Farsi and responds to Taliban's policies eliminating my identity and woman as a poet, as a professional, as a human being. درود بر روان پاک شهیدان رای آزادی من زن خراسانیم جسورم و غیورم جز نشان خورشید ندارم در جبینم میهن نامی تو در باورم من که فرزند تخمینه و جمشیدم وارث رابعه و فردوسی و سنایم من لفظ فارسی را تا عبد پاس بانم وطن یعنی اجدادم مادرم پدرم به جانم سوگند به جانم سوگند که به خون بستم این عد و قیمانم میهنم را پاک سازم ز استبداد و کین با عشق که در ریشه در خون دارم هویتم اصلیتم هویتم اصلیتم را در نام تو می جویم قدرتم را در ریشه دیرین تو می پویم فرهنگ من شکوه من افتخار من که کروش نوشت عشقت در سرشتم من هرگز نپذیرم آین و عرب و عجم که من خود آین ستانم وطن می پرستمت زمن مپرس که چرا می پرستمت فرمان احوراز نه از احری منانم ز کابل تا شیراز و دوشنبه فرخته دارم در تهران و از فخان و هیرات ریشه دارم عشق مولانا در دل بلخ و کونیا و تبریزم که من از باغ مشهد و بدخشان می و چینم وطن سودای عشق آتش افگنده در عالم با اندوه دیرین دل به پردای تو می بندم تینکیو Such a wonderful poem, and uh, this is another way of uh, we call it heart when ladies are taking lead. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, and honor to be here. Uh, it's just uh, unbelievable. Last year, me and uh, Zalma Inshad and uh, Dr. John Cassie and Dr. Robert Miller were sitting here and discussing about this conference and. Uh, At the time, obviously, the situation of Afghanistan was completely different, but unfortunately, here we are. And uh, another thing I wanted to mention, like one and a half year ago, when Ahmad Masood was in London and we met in Agafan Center, and many other friends were invited there, after the meeting, we had a discussion, and his dream was to establish a sort of network like Agafan Network AKDN to provide school uh, and uh, sort of building school and uh, medicine center in Afghanistan and he said that he was a friend of my father and I want to ask for his guide and help in this uh, way but unfortunately now things have turned uh, again completely different and he has to fight for freedom of his country and his people. So it's like a, it's a similar scenario as we always seen and in the traditional narrative of uh, our predecessors and Zoroastrian teaching its war between evil 
and good. And unfortunately, currently, it's just war against evil and those who are behind them. So I don't want to talk much about it. And taking this opportunity, would like to introduce uh, Sir Nicholas Barrington, diplomat. Uh, Sir Nicholas Barrington was a career diplomat for 37 years prior to the retirement in 1994. He has served as a in a variety of posts overseas, uh, including Afghanistan, Iran, Egypt, and Pakistan, where he ended his high commissioner. And uh, we have his present here. I would like to ask him, please go ahead, take a lead. And Thank you very much. And this is an excellent idea. And I hope this will be one of the first of a series of, of meetings about Afghanistan, because one of the important things is that the world, with all these other problems going on, mustn't forget about Afghanistan. That's essential. That should be one of the messages we send out. I'm not an academic, but a considerable part of my diplomatic career was spent in dealing with Afghanistan, and I have great affection for the country and its people. Uh, a lot of the information, actually, I put down in my, my first book of mem diplomatic memoirs, which is there called Envoy. I've been rereading it and finding it rather good. I rather enjoy reading my memoirs. They remind me of a lot of names and things that happened in my days. And uh, I think it's, it's worth it. It didn't get much publicity and it wasn't very well edited, but it, there's a lot of good value in it. Now, I lived in Kabul and worked in Kabul in the embassy between 1959 and 61, which I think is before all of you, probably. Uh, the, the, the country was run by Prince Dawood, the king's cousin, and with a very firm hand on behalf of the royal family. Uh, it was a functioning state. Everyone was safe. You could walk around and drive around the country very happily. The danger in the country was the dogs of the, of the farmers because they were so fierce, they were designed to keep wolves at bay, and therefore they would often attack uh, uh, land rovers. Um, Dowd was a strange character. He, he was gradually introducing some girls' education. Um, and I was present at a very special occasion at the, at the National Day when the senior wives of the royal family came without a veil. That was deliberately done. First of all, it was Naim, his, 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 his brother's wife, and then her daughters the next day, and then some others. It was a major transformation. There wasn't much fuss about that in the country. There wasn't, as far as one can see, any huge Islamic sort of extreme views. Uh, what there were were expressed by the mullahs of the Shaw Bazaar in the center of Kabul, the Mujahideen mullahs. And they, they protested a bit, but they were kept under control. Um, the, um, the public was actually extraordinarily welcoming. It was a time when a lot of students came over through, Af through um, uh, Iran and, and Afghanistan over to Kathmandu to get high on, on cannabis things. And they, it was a sort of, that was the fashion of the thing to do. And whenever these travelers came through, they came through, they were received with immense hospitality by the Afghans of all, all people, and, and the traditional of giving everything they had to the visitors. Um, I was, uh, the, the not extreme Islamic views, but of course there were the Sufi organizations, uh, particularly the, the Tariq, uh, the Qadiriya Tariqa, uh, which goes back a long way, the Gilani family were the leaders of that, and they were great friends of mine. They were well established linked with the royal family too. There was, of course, the Ansari people in Herat, and the Nachbandis. Uh, the Mujahideen were technically Nachbandis, although they didn't think they were Sufis. The person who was a Sufi was Ustad Khalili, who the poet who was uh, from uh, the coast down north of Kabul. And I used to, the junior diplomat, I used to take people to see him and go and make a point of calling on him. He, he was a great poet. I'm sure many of you here can, can quote uh, Khalili's poetry. Here's one of them. Shorat Talabi bi honari duni chand kerdan jahan rabbi jahanan monand sadba zami khuni mardum tarshod tarnami falan ibn falan gasht bulan. There's time afterwards, I will translate that. 
<laughs> um, the Darwin was gradually doing things he didn't approve of. He made a huge thing of the idea of Pashtunistan, which we forget about now, the idea of countries for students, which meant destroying Pakistan and naturally irritated the Pakistanis. And in fact, when I was there, he had all the Pakistanis, except for the diplomats, expelled from Afghanistan. So one forgets some of these reasons for Pakistan's anti antipathy towards Afghanistan uh, were there in the past. The other thing was that he was determined to be the great buffer state between the Russians and the Americans. He, had, uh, he played off one against the other. Uh, in fact, we had visits by both Eisenhower and Khrushchev when I was there. Outside the Russian tent, I actually shook the podgy hand of Mr. Khrushchev, which I'm rather proud of. <laughs> but uh, otherwise, um, he, he thought it was, he thought it, he, he didn't realize that compared with what the British and Russians had been doing, keeping Afghanistan as a buffer state, the situation had changed. The British had gone, the Americans were far away, the Russians were very near and very greedy. And here's when I don't agree with my diplomatic colleague, Roderick Braithwaite, who's gone through the Russian files very carefully in that excellent book, Afghanistan, in many ways. I don't believe the Russians invaded Afghanistan because they wanted to improve the living of the ordinary people. They were actually, they were greedy people. They wanted to increase, they wanted to turn the buffer state into a, a Soviet satellite. Um, as the only Persian speaker in the embassy, in the small embassy, because it wasn't very important for London, uh, I had a large number of, of Afghan friends, I'm glad to say. Uh, among them were particularly several lecturers in the law faculty, one of whom was the most distinguished Afghanistan I most admire and most met. I never had the privilege of meeting Ahmad Shah Massoud because he was always in Afghanistan when I was in, in, in Pakistan or elsewhere. And this was Musa Shafiq Kamawi, who I don't know whether any of you know about him now, a great, very great man in my view. He straddled both Islamic and the Western ideas. His father was a Mujtahid from the Mormon territory, a great scholar, and he, he knew all about the scholarship of Islam, but he himself had been to Columbia University and had been to universities in the West, and he understood both. Uh, later on, I went away for four years, after, I mean, four years in, in Brussels and in London after my period in Afghanistan. And then I was posted to Pakistan for a short time where, first of all, it was the Gulf War, uh, I, mean, I mean, the Kashmir War. And then we used to go out for holidays in Afghanistan in those days. It was quite a routine thing to go up and have a nice holiday in Astana, a beautiful place, Pagman and so on, those places, perfectly safe. And I had a long talk to um, Musa Shafiq, who I had the endless discussions with about the future of Afghanistan. He told me what had happened. In 1963, Daoud decided that he didn't have enough power. He wanted to actually be president. So he told the king, look, I, I, I'm, I'm running this country, but I really want to be now definitely the head of it as president. And the king said, uh, look, the king was a rather passive person, decent man. He said, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, you're, you're doing it on behalf of the royal family. You've got the power now. Let's not upset the apple cart and so on. And Dowd, in a huff, resigned and went away for 10 years and sulked in his states near Jalalabad. And the king was left in charge and had to think about how what to do with the constitution. And people like Musa Shafiq and others, including Said Kashim Reshtiar, said, friend of mine and others, they promulgated the new constitution, which kept the royal family out of politics. They started also the idea of a Lloyd Yerga and an assembly, which for the first time, people from all parts of Afghanistan had a vote. I don't think this had happened before. I think it was the beginning of sort of democracy in, in Pakistan, in, in Afghanistan. And, and the, there was this beginning of oppressed things and the, free, the general freedom. It was a very happy period, actually, in, in life in Afghanistan in those days. But then, of course, uh, we know what happened. By the way, during that time, I'm a the king made a state visit to London, and I saw a bit of that. That's mentioned in the book. But uh, then in 10 years later, 1973, of course, Dow did a coup uh, when the king was, was um, on one of his holidays in, in, uh, in, in Italy uh, and took over and made himself president, uh, removed all the other officials. And he only did that with the help of leftist army officers. Because Dowd had previously said, I will send my lot of my army to be trained in Moscow. Don't worry, communists, uh, I mean, Muslims never become communists. We, kept, we were warning him about that, all the dangers of that. But this was proved now because these people helped him. And, and he, he, got, he took over. And then, of course, uh, he couldn't really, the Russians then had immense sort of strength and power control over Afghanistan through him. He tried to get more independent of them. 
And when he tried to get more independent of them, then there was the full communist coup, which was a major, a major change, of course. Communist coup, uh, communist by a man called Tanaki. Very interesting. The, 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 uh, the main leader of the communist coup was, I'm sure, a very sincere communist. Apparently, he came from a Kuchi tribe, a small tribe, uh, one of the Kuchis, the nomadic groups, which is extraordinary, really. Um, but he, he, what he did, he tried to transform the whole of Afghanistan by sending people to, to preach communism in the villages, which didn't go down terribly well. And then they actually killed a lot of the educated people throughout Afghanistan. They killed a lot of the teachers, a lot of the local government people, the mayors and so on, were eliminated. That was the idea of the communists taking over. After a bit, uh, his, his successor, his deputy, Hafizul Amin, uh, decided that he wanted to take power, and Tarake was removed, and Amin took over. I'm not sure what to believe about Amin. Amin was a man who was who had been in, in America, uh, and he had lots of uh, different ideas. And the Russians considered him a psychopath. They, did, they didn't like him because they thought, I think, he might prove more independent. I think he might have been like Sadat and sent a lot of the Russian uh, experts home because when the communists took over, the Russians put communist uh, people in all the missionaries, advisors in all the, mission, or in, in all the ministries. Uh, and they decided they weren't going to tolerate Amin. I think it's a question mark as to for historians about how really he guilty Amin was. And anyway, um, uh, they took over, of course, and for a time that, that was communist rule. Um, it, it was a Dowd family, many of whom I knew, was slaughtered in the palace in those days. Um, and of course, that was the period when the heroes in resistance, including Ahmad Shah Massoud, who I never met because he was always in. in uh, Guinness, I did meet Ismail Khan once, I knew Abdul Haq and I knew some of the others, because I was posted back uh, much, much later as High Commissioner in Pakistan in 1987. And those were the last years of the communists and the communists were feeling weak. Uh, and then uh, the, uh, the, the Pakistan government, well, there's a lot of been criticism of the Pakistanis, and I'm sure there is a lot of criticism can be made. I, they ought to have some Pakistanis here to defend themselves in some ways. The Pakistanis were naturally and still are very much concerned about Indian influence and the Kashmir situation. Um, that's true. I mean, the Kashmir is in a dreadful situation now. The Indians got on very well with, with Afghanistan and they had consulates right over just the borders of the, uh, 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 of the posts and in, 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 uh, border posts. And uh, anyway, the, the Pakistanis, you had both the ISI, who were, of course speaking on behalf of the army, and the government itself, the North Korea government was actually genuinely trying, I think, at this stage, when it looked as if the communists were disappearing, disappearing uh, to try and get some coalition going. And we talked about the things about how that coalition might, might be going. Um, and uh, uh, they, they did make agreement with the only parts concerned, the Iranians, the Saudis, and the Pakistanis. They had vows, and they also agreed in, in, uh, in Mecca, I think, that there would be a new coalition which would be uh, Rabani as president, Ahmad Yar as prime minister. And of course that didn't work out because Rabani insisted about having Masood as defense minister and Ahmad Yar uh, then shelled Kobo, which was absolutely disgraceful. That was an awful period of time. It, it's covered up. There's lots of more need to be done about that. It wasn't, it wasn't a very satisfactory situation, I must say. I'm afraid. Uh, not, not many of the Mujahideen really stuck together uh, as, as they should have done. Um, I know I, I, must, I must go on quickly because we have other things. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the Taliban, of course, took over then later on. Um, the, the Hekmat, Hekmat is interesting. We haven't hardly mentioned Hekmat Yar, but of course he was primary in the ideas of Masood. What do we know about Hekmat Yar? He's still alive. He, he's still around. He was educated. He spoke English rather well. He had a bit of a sense of humor. He was considered by, by Sandy as being completely, um, you know, a, a pawn of the Pakistanis. I think he probably thought the Pakistanis were working for him too. I don't believe he was really uh, a, a sincere, extreme Islamicist. I believe he was really out for his own power. And we don't know really enough about him. Uh, he was quite a clever operator. When they decided on an interim government, the first idea was to have Mujadidi, a relation of the other Mujadidi, except a decent chap, 
as the interim president of Mujahideen. And we had British Foreign Minister uh, Jeffrey Howe staying with me when I was High Commissioner in, in Islamabad. And I took him to see Mujahideen. The first time we had sort of semi-recognition of the Mujahideen. And in fact, I was there at the time. I noticed he spoke good English and had quite a sense of humor. And that, that time he was speaking quite eloquently for the case uh, of the Mujahideen in general against the Russians. More needs to be done about Hekman Yar's position because when the Taliban came through uh, and from, from, from Kandahar up, up into, from uh, um, Pakistan up into Kandahar, then moved across, uh, this was the time when they were coming strongly and Masood felt he had to go back to Panjshir and so on. When they got to Saroka, where the Hekman Yar's thing was, he was extremely annoyed because they took over. He thought he was, he was a, a, a similar view to them. But, but he didn't know what he didn't know how to, how to blame. He couldn't, couldn't understand why they hadn't greeted him. And in fact, what he said in public was, um, these Taliban people, who are they? That they must be a creation of uh, Sir Nicholas Barrington, the British High Commissioner. <laughs> that was because I had had row with Hekmadia about, um, about Ship Kobe. Mentioned in the book how the uh, uh, Sandy's photographer, Ship Koviak, was a British subject who was murdered by, and I knew it was murdered by Hekman Jass people, I knew Burrow about him, and that made our uh, uh, that difficulty. Fine, a few points. Um, I think Sandy's book is excellent. Zood's diaries must be, must be preserved and learned. Uh, we, we must keep alive the interest in Afghanistan. There's an Afghanistan society that's been created in London to keep interest in all aspects of life in Afghanistan, culture and so on as well. I believe the people in Afghanistan don't want, as the Americans seem to suggest, uh, a completely extreme Islamic government. I don't believe they do. They want security. <clears throat> they didn't want a complete communist government. They, didn't, they want security. They, they don't want a Western government which allows the time for, for corruption and so on. So I, I believe that, the, I don't believe, frankly, that the Taliban is going to last very long. I think they have huge different views, series of views, and I think they'll split up and they'll have had great difficulty. Unfortunately, when Americans decided, our American friends decided to go, they didn't consult anyone, they didn't consult the British, not just the British, the Europeans. I mean, here's an example of the Italians. They, that's where, where the royal family used to go and stay in Italy. Uh, the French who were very much leaders of the question of, of the uh, monuments of Afghanistan. And in fact, it's terribly important we try and preserve the monuments and stop them destroying them now if we can as this charming lady is right, but I'm something as I believe very much indeed. And indeed, indeed the Germans, because when the Afghanistan was in the middle of a battle between the British and the Russians, both colonial powers, the Germans were seen as rather heroic non-colonial powers. So there's a lot more Europe that could have been done together if we'd all kept united as we should have done. And uh, we, must, we must make sure, of course, in the future, that, that the women protected. Also, the ethnic minorities are very important. That's perhaps not been enough and uh, otherwise we must keep going and try and find a new way of leadership. I think you'll have to find some unifying factor. I suggested at one time the king and maybe it's too fast for that, but they need a unifying factor that people like Masood, the people of his view, and the Pashtun speaking must have a strong Pashtun element that can combine together under one unifying factor, uh, a unifying body if it's an individual or a group Ben and Seven tried hard to do that. And that's the best hope. We must keep on struggling in that way while these wretched Taliban are in, are in Kabul. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for going on.